Today on Call for Two, a spoiler-free look at the longest, most epic, hardcore detective narrative mystery games that I've played. Is there one that's right for you? Let's find out. Let's start with the rules for this video. These are all narrative detective mystery games in the spirit of Sherlock Holmes consulting detective. They have no luck, there are no time limits, you win by answering questions at the end to show you understand the mystery. These are not primarily puzzle cipher games, which is a different genre, which has its own long form entries. All of the games that I'm going to be talking about here, I've picked an arbitrary cutoff time of 14 hours of playtime on the channel. No games that uh, played in less than that. But that 14 hour cutoff is not how long it will take you to play the games. You should probably divide that by two or three even to get your playtime. When I play them on the channel, we take long breaks, we have a half hour discussion of the history of the game before we get started, etc. So these times are sort of inflated compared to what they'll take you. These are only games I have personally played and finished and purchased myself. None of these games are provided by publishers. And as I said, you can watch the full playthroughs of almost all of these games on the channel. And then I typically make a separate standalone spoiler free review, which you could watch if one of these games piques your interest. I've ranked them from shortest playtime to longest playtime. So my final entry in this video will be the longest playing game. And then at the end, I'll give some tips and advice on getting the most from these long form marathon games. Before we get started, let's talk about some honorary mentions. I said this list is going to focus on narrative detective mystery games that are mostly about deduction in the style of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. But if you're interested in long form mystery narrative that's focused on puzzles, you've got some other choices you can make. The most well-known series of games in this form are the Hunt a Killer series. This is a subscription-based service, but you can buy their full seasons. Here we have Blair Witch Season 1, six episodes. That would cost you $100 on sale, um, maybe close to double that if you bought it on subscription. These are games with a very high production quality, lots of props like hats and locked boxes and physical items, so they're more of a full experience. And they've got a story and they've got multimedia elements and a good website and all that. And it's, it's definitely a unique experience and if you buy a full season, you could expect to have a long epic um, experience. This uh, set we played on the channel. It took us about 20 hours to play. Remember you 20, 22 hours. You would divide that in half if you played at home. And there are other subscription services. Deadbolt Mystery Society normally makes single one-off boxes. We played one of them, The Cabin, on the channel. It took us about 13 hours. Might be a little unusual to take that long. But they do have some connected boxes that are part of a continuing story. And if you bought one of those, you could easily get into the 20 hour range, or at least I could. Again, divide by half for you. And then there are a couple other mail order games. Again, these are puzzle and puzzle based. Another one in that category is Cozy Killer. That might be one of the most expensive subscription services. You might expect to pay almost $300 for a set of 12 episodes. But again, high production quality, very immersive experience. Then we've got here 
some play by mail games. Uh, one, both of these I've been playing on the channel and those are much closer to Sherlock Holmes consulting detective system, but each move you submit to a website and then you wait for a week to get a reply in the mail with a physical printout of the, your, your, the leads you followed. And you could probably expect in total for one of these games, which costs about $40, there's two of them, there's a Sherlock Holmes and an L.A. Noir, and actually there's a third. You might expect a total of 13 sessions, each an hour long. And then last honorable mention I wanted to do was for the Escape Tales series. These are much more traditional board game format games, but these are basically puzzle games with some story interleaved. They're quite good, and they are some of the longest playing such board games. The listed time here is three sessions of three hours each, so nine hours total. So when I play this, you would at least double that. So we're probably talking about 20 hours of gameplay in each of these boxes. And um, if you like puzzle games and board games, uh, it's hard to beat this in terms of bang for your buck. Okay, so there are our honorable mentions. If there's some that I missed, let me know. Let's start now with the main list. We begin the list at number 10 with Postmortem LA Lucha Muerte. Remember that I'm listing these in order of shortest playtime to longest playtime, not in order of my preference for these games. Uh, Postmortem LA Lucha Muerte is the third in a series of Postmortem LA games. They're made by the Mysterious Package Company. You can buy them directly from their website. They're still on sale. They're $50 each. This is a game very similar to Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. You can see we've got a map with locations, a directory where we can look up and visit people. Unlike Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, instead of entries in a double column eight and a half by 11 book, we've got a little paperback mystery book here. This, you can see this third in the series, which a Muerte is the longest of the games. It took us about 15 hours in two playthroughs to play through this. Uh, I'd rank it uh, at a difficulty of mm, on the easier side, maybe four out of 10, five out of 10. This series has probably the best writing of any game in this genre. Maybe the best writing of any board game I've played. There's a reason for that. You can find out that reason if you watch my spoiler-free review of the series. We've played all three of these in the series. Lucha Muerte, I'm not sure, was my favorite of the three. They're all incredible. They all really capture the film noir feel and style, and it's just an amazing world to walk around in. It feels like you're in a living, breathing world. There's actually, as of October 2022, a new game in the series or sort of mm, uh, adjacent series called Postmortem London Gothic, not set in LA, a bit supernatural, but continuing on in the spirit of this game. And you can see actually one of the interesting ways that this game differs from Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, of which it's clearly based. Here's your newspaper, that's normal. But also in the box, you'll find six little envelopes of evidence. This is evidence that the game will direct you to open up and take a look at. Mostly just props like you would find in a subscription company game. Mostly just to make it more fun and immersive. Don't add that much to the mystery, but there's some clever stuff going on in this box. Highly recommend the entire series. Sometimes you can get them all on sale together or find them used on eBay. Number 10, Postmortem LA, Lucha Muerte. Number nine on our list is Who Killed Robert Prentice, which is a crime dossier book from 1930s. And that requires a little bit of explanation. In the 1930s, Dennis Wheatley, who's a very famous writer of the time, had the idea to make these crime mystery books, fair play mystery books, where you read through the story in the form of evidence and try to solve the mystery. So we've got a big narrative here of the story. 
And then we've got actual evidence throughout. Photographs of crime scenes, actual letters. We've got a huge multi-page newspaper with lots of little stories and reports from a trial and then actual physical evidence like chemicals and letters and pills and all that stuff. And then when you get to the end, when you think you understand it, you break open this, you try to answer who did it, and then you read a long epilogue. These are sort of hybrids between mystery books and games. I do consider them, however, games and part of this genre. You might consider these the foundation of our modern document dump cold case file games that you can find now dime a dozen on Amazon. There are four books for crime dossiers in this British series. Who Killed Robert Prentice is the second one, but in terms of engagement, emotional engagement in writing, uh, this is my favorite. It took us 16 hours to play through this, to go through this, to read it all aloud in two parts on the YouTube channel. I would consider this maybe difficulty level of four out of 10 or five out of 10. It is a completely different experience like reading a book. You can see my spoiler free review of all four books in this series. And I would really recommend this if you're really mostly want to read a great book with character development and emotional engagement. Unique experience. And if you want to see how we got our modern cold case games this is where to start. Continuing directly from our number nine is number eight, File on Rufus Ray. This is another crime dossier from the 30s. After Dennis Wheatley did his four in the UK that took the world by storm, the Americans wanted in on it, and they hired a bunch of writers, real mystery writers, to pen some American versions, and they released these in these Crime file series. Again, four of these. They actually share the first one. This is number two in my favorite file on Rufus Ray by Helen Riley. Same idea, you're reading a police procedural. Here, it's much more moment by moment police reports and evidence, not quite as much of a narrative not quite as much told as a standard mystery book, but more through police reports. To me, this is the most, this is the most true feeling of being in a police procedural. I believe this was New York City. This is set in. And so we've got lots of detective reports written by Helen Riley, who is an accomplished mystery police procedural writer, and it really feels like it humor, lots of evidence, lots of dialogue that sounds right between detectives and police officers. Uh, maybe not as much physical evidence, but letters, uh, some physical evidence, but mostly lots of police reports. My favorite of the series Six, took us about 16 hours to play through in two parts. Again, I would rate this at maybe four or five out of 10 difficulty. This is my favorite of the crime dossier series, including the British and Americans. Of the ones we've played, this is my favorite so far. And, uh, but I would recommend the entire set. And you can watch my playthrough of this on YouTube, and uh, we're going to actually get to three and four, which we haven't played yet soon on the channel, if you'd like to join us for those. Okay, with number seven, we're back on familiar ground. This is Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, The Baker Street Irregulars Box by Dave Neal, published in 2020. From my perspective, this is the pinnacle of the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective series. It follows the same approach as the modern reprints, which is each case has its own booklet here. We've got our traditional Sherlock Holmes consulting detective map, 
Same map as used in all the other games and directory, and we've got newspapers for each case. There are a couple new mechanics uh, added to the game that sort of gate your progress, make sure you don't read anything when you shouldn't, but essentially the same rules. Here we have the cases. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They've stopped putting ten in each box because that seems overly generous for 2020 going forward, but this box is just packed with gameplay. The first half of these cases are completely standalone. Each newspaper, one newspaper for each case. The second half of the games are lightly connected in a campaign. And then the very last case of the box is maybe double or triple length of the normal cases. And triple the length of a normal Sherlock Holmes consulting detective game. So this is got the most gameplay of any Sherlock Holmes consulting detective box that's been released and of higher quality than any other box. Almost all of the cases in this box are very well done. Some are the best games ever written in this genre. And case 10 is a sort of tour de force. Took us 18 hours to play in three parts. And I would rate that at a higher level of difficulty than most of these, although on par with the hard Sherlock Holmes consulting detective cases, maybe seven out of 10. Um, fantastic writing, but also in addition to the great writing, the mysteries are some of the most enjoyable to chew on and work out and try to figure out. So really overall best bang for your buck of any game in this list that you can buy. The pinnacle of Sherlock Holmes consulting detective work. Uh, couldn't recommend this more Highly. This is where to start if you're interested in this genre. I played every case in this box live on the YouTube channel and then I posted a spoiler free review of the series that you can watch. Um, but yeah, so my 18 hour playthrough in three parts is just for the final case. The other cases are shorter, but you can imagine if you got eight, if, if I got 18 hours out of the final case, the whole set as a whole, much more. So if you're looking for something to tide you over for a month or so, work your way through this box, you won't be sorry. Coming up at number six is Mortem Medieval Detective. This was a game published in 2021. It's actually a, made up of a loose campaign of three games. This is a card-based mystery adventure game with some hybrid gaming mechanics, but essentially you turn over cards to reveal more of the mystery. Some of them form a map as you lay it out on your board. It's sort of a combination between detective modern crime board game and hmm, almost like a little bit of Seventh Continent with some gamey elements. Uh, some interesting day-night cycle. It was more of a good idea than a great implementation and story and mystery. Not one of my favorite mystery games. Took us about 18 hours to play through this in three sessions. You can watch my playthrough on YouTube of each of the sessions and also my quick spoiler free review. I would rate the difficulty maybe four out of 10. Very light on deduction, more of a choose your own adventure. I think the system has potential, but wasn't quite realized in this implementation. I would say this is probably my least favorite game on this list. Next up at number five is Detective, a modern crime board game. This was a very divisive game that came out in 2018. Some people absolutely were head over heels for it. Other people thought it was a step backwards in this genre. But it was an attempt to have a modern mystery detective game, but with some real gamey elements. And it did combine a serious use of a website to do DNA and fingerprint analysis type stuff, 
and some multimedia files with a card play based system. So instead of a book um, of paragraphs to read, all of the text is on cards. There's a bunch of expansions for it as well. Five cases in the base set. All of your story is on cards along with some gamey elements. For example, you have to spend certain kill, uh, skills tokens to investigate certain leads more than others. You won't be able to see everything. Different groups will take different paths to solving the cases. Five connected cases in an overall overarching story that does connect. It's all part of one story. Again, a bunch of gamey elements in terms of managing time, traveling that takes time. A very ambitious experimental game. Some of it worked quite well, some of it not so much. We played this, Greg and I, over Zoom during the pandemic, so it's not on the channel, unfortunately, but I estimate it would probably take us about 25 hours if we were to play it on the channel. So a very rich, long experience. Now, I really enjoyed it, but I do think that Greg, not so much. And I think that came down to whether the journey is the important thing or whether having a satisfying final explanation of the mysteries is the most important thing for me, for you. And for me, it's the journey is more important than the final wrap up. And I think this game does let you down a little bit in terms of making sense out of everything. And it's much more of a, it's much easier to see a certain group having a bad time by getting unlucky. So I would rate this as a difficulty of maybe six or seven out of 10, depending on your luck going through it and the choices you make. I do think the bottom line for this game, more than many of the others, is you will get out of it what you put in. If you really enjoy the process and take your time, really chew over stuff, you're going to enjoy this more. Uh, if you want the pure deduction, this may rub you the wrong way. Although you can't watch my playthrough of this on the channel or review, you could check out my playthrough and review of Dune House Secrets which was a spin-off of one of the two major, actually three now, spin-offs of this system. But you can watch my playthroughs of Dune House Secrets and my critical review. I was not a huge fan of the system, but we'll see a little bit later in this list another game that I was a fan of. Number four on my list is an unusual one. This is Razorhurst a game, a free print and play game created by John Keane and posted on Board Game Geek. You can download it for free. You can play it uh, directly from a PDF. There's no need for you to print out all of it, but you can see how serious this game is in terms of how much writing and work went into it. There's a whole bunch of historical information about the, how the game was created. It's based on a true crime that happened in Australia in the 20s. It took me about 22 hours to play this on YouTube in three different parts. I'd rate it at a difficulty of maybe 6 out of 10. It's got some really interesting, unique mechanics here in terms of a day-night cycle and stamina and recovery. And it promises a little bit, in some ways it promises a little bit more than it, could, it can deliver in terms of evidentiary um, details like ballistics and fingerprints and all that. But on the other hand, it's a unique entry into this genre. The writing is a very high quality. It's a little bit of a choose your adventure stuff, but it's really grounded in a true story in a very small scale case of a small murder and really chasing down all the leads. There's some interesting map travel stuff. Um, I think 
this was one of my m most surprising experiences in the last couple years coming across this, but I do think it helps to go in here with low expectations. But especially if you're a fan of true crime and history, this really does give you a unique peek into 1920, gang, 1920s gangland Australia. And uh, you can see our full playthrough of this on the channel, but also my long review of the experience and with a specific focus on game design issues. Coming in at number three is Vienna Connection. This is a 2021 game that was an evolution of the detective modern crime board game family. Set in 1970s Cold War in a campaign of four or five missions. You can see each one here now comes in its own little envelope with some secret brief briefing information. And the really notable part about this game, we've got a map that you mainly don't use and a large amount of the story is told in the form of these cards. Again, shares some of the same approach of detective modern crime in terms of trying to add some gamey elements, but it sort of dials back on those and goes to a much more controlled mystery. But the highlight of this game is this generous stack of a hundred full-size sheets. And here you basically get the evidence, sort of the document dump cold case games in a different format. So here we've got maps, transcripts, police reports, all sorts of fascinating stuff that the game directs you to go retrieve at different points. So it'll say, go get pages three through 10 from the uh, from the pages and read them and it really creates the sense of suspense and enjoyment at discovering this new document and it captures this sort of Cold War spy feel. It took us 28 hours to play through this over four different sessions. I'd rank it at maybe 5 out of 10 difficulty or so. Um, it's not the best writing in terms of subtlety and humor, but in terms of a full engrossing long experience and putting you in this world and making you feel like you're working with real primary documents, it does a very good job. And it's great that it minimized the gamey push your luck elements that we see now in the other spin-offs of Detective series. You can also watch my long spoiler free review of the game with a special emphasis on game design issues. But uh, one of the highlights of this series and of the entire genre. Coming in at number two, ranked in order of playtime, is Adventures by Gaslight. This was a Sherlock Holmes consulting detective standalone module. And um, it's the only big box expansion for Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective that has not been reprinted. So this is the original from 1986. It's out of print, but you can get it on eBay sometimes, maybe for around $100. It took us 47 hours to play through this, divided into seven parts. It's not going to take you that long to play it. We really took our time with it. And this is a sort of notorious case. There's a reason. It's just one case. And there's a reason possibly why it wasn't reprinted, which is that it has some, I wouldn't call them flaws, but it's extremely difficult to solve. Perhaps unfair to expect you to solve it as is. I'll come back to that. Uh, but it's a good example of a very small scale case, um, not even a murder, but then that's really deeply explored and you travel to France and you, it's also a great example of actually putting you in a time and place. One of the reasons why these Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games are so beloved is that 
you really feel like you're traveling back in time. And this game does it better than uh, almost any other Sherlock Holmes consulting detective case. Um, you've got the case introduction, which spans a couple of days in gameplay. You've got three different double-sided large newspapers. Then you've got the actual clue book that makes up the game. Uh, you would use the normal map of London, but also this Paris map. Comes with an extra little postcard. And then something else that I'll talk about in a second. But let me just say that I think probably the playthrough we did of Adventures by Gaslight over those 47 hours might be my favorite detective experience in the last few years, or ever, I guess you could say. And um, you can watch that entire thing on the YouTube channel. And part of what made it so enjoyable and what made it take so long is that I played it with a friend who I discovered through the channel, Jonathan, and he and I really decided to go all in on this game and really try to invest our time and thoughts into it. That means long discussions throughout the case of trying to understand what was going on. And we knew going into it that this game had a reputation for frustrating people and being unsatisfying. So we sort of knew that the ultimate solution was going to be unsatisfying or unsolvable. But we just embraced that and really tried to figure it out. The other reason why this game can grind you down to a halt, and it certainly did for us, is that there's a very difficult cipher code in the middle of the game that took us days and days offline and on the live stream figuring out. And maybe more than any other game, Detective actually had some of this too, but more than any other game, I spent uh, sleepless nights tossing and turning trying to make sense of this case. And we spent many hours just trying to understand how to make the basic facts of this case make sense. Now that either sounds amazing to you or it sounds like hell. For me, that's the amazing part. That's the most fun of any of these games is when you've got some simple facts and you simply cannot find a consistent explanation for those facts. Dave Neal does that very well in his Baker Street Irregulars box and this game really, really just leans into that experience. Now, when we finished the game, we weren't entirely satisfied, as expected, based on its reputation with the game. So what we did actually when we finished, we were so engrossed in this game, had such a great time with it, fell in love with it for the most part, that we wrote a patch kit, a little PDF, not so little, about 70 pages or so, where we tried to improve it a bit. So what we wrote was, we wrote a couple of changes, added a new map, added a couple new big clue entry replacements, and then we replaced the questions with questions we thought were better. And then we added a very long tiered hint system. So you could go and get hints on the cipher just a little bit at a time. And then we wrote an entirely new epilogue that we thought was befitting and would do justice to the game. And we tried to change as little as possible in the the spirit of the game. So if you're interested in a big, long, epic experience and you're willing to put the work and investment in, I really do recommend this. Maybe don't start with this, of course. And then check out our patch kit if you want, if you trust me enough to improve the experience for you. As I said, 47 hours over seven sessions, and I might give this a difficulty of maybe nine, or ten, nine, nine out of 10 in its original form at least. And you can watch my long review, spoiler-free review of the game where I discuss game design issues and the nature of this genre. So there you have it, number two, in terms of length, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective Adventures by Gaslight.
Coming in at number one on our list of longest, most epic, hardcore narrative mystery detective games is a game, game from 1985 called Gumshoe. Gumshoe was made by the same company that made Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. It was their most ambitious spin-off sort of came at the end of the company, unfortunately. And it is the most ambitious and largest of all the games I've covered by a fairly wide margin. It's a campaign set in the 1930s LA, sort of a film noir feel. You can see here are my books of notes that I took while I played the game. So, Nine or ten days in the world of L.A. in the 30s. Each day has a large, dense newspaper to go through. There is a large phone directory. White pages, yellow pages. I mean, you really get the feel that this is a full-blown world out here. And then two very large maps of LA. I mean, these are just ridiculously large maps. Here's a huge map of San Francisco. Now, you don't make much use of this map, to be honest. Unlike Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, where you're going to places by finding them on the map, this uses what they call a clue point system. So, as you play the game, you start on the first day where you get a little introduction story. And then you've got a set of places you can visit on the first day. They're listed by address and you'll have to figure out what addresses you want to go to. The same way you would in Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. But rather than looking at places on the map, you'll be looking for them in directory, in the story, in the newspaper, etc. So the first quarter of the book go through the different days. So after you finish a day, you move to the next day, then the story advances and so on till you get to the final day. And then past that are the clues in this book. And within the clues are some gamey elements. There's some choose your own adventure stuff. There's some, uh, reports that you'll get in the course of your investigation. You'll pick up fingerprints. There's a set of autopsies that get revealed as you play the game. There's an entire stack of fingerprint cards and mug sheets, along with their criminal records of each of these criminals. And a set of fingerprint cards that would be filed away and an entire description in the rules of how to do fingerprint analysis, how to analyze fingerprints and do matching, and you'll have to take that quite seriously. In order to do fingerprint matching, we've got some additional reports here, some lab reports, diagrams of crime scenes, ballistics, etc. And essentially, it's not one big case. Essentially, there are a whole bunch of little cases that are sort of strung throughout these nine or ten days that you play. And more than any of these games, by a wide margin, you'll have to take good notes in order to follow what's going on in multiple cases spanning multiple days. It's a unique experience in terms of just the uh, overwhelming amount of information. The individual cases aren't super difficult um, in and of themselves, and they're not the best mysteries compared to something like the modern Baker Street Irregulars box, but in terms of sort of immersing you in this world and giving you a real feeling of handling different cases that are overlapping and having to juggle all that. Just the sheer amount of information and the amount of work you'll have to do in matching fingerprints and checking reports 
is so high that it will really scratch that itch of wanting to be a real detective and scratch the itch of rewarding you for being good at note-taking. Now, unfortunately, I didn't play through the entire box on the channel. It just became too over too much for me to play through on the channel, and this was when I had to play this completely solo. So you can watch the first couple days playthrough on YouTube, and you can watch my long review of the entire box experience, along with a couple of videos I made for how I would advise you to approach this game if you decide to play it. But I would estimate maybe 60 hours to play through this. For me, again, you would divide by two or three and maybe a difficulty level of seven or eight out of 10. It is a completely unique and unrivaled experience as an epic experience. It's out of print, but you can get a copy on eBay Somewhere, if you're lucky, around 100 bucks, it does go higher than that. You do want to try to get the second edition. First edition had lots of flaws. And you can watch my um, video to get a little bit more of the history of this game. It's not without flaws. In fact, it's got some... It, it feels in some ways like an experiment. There are real experimental time limit time of day things that are happening here. And you'll have to figure out how you want to approach those. There's some good threads on Board Game Geek about it, but I would suggest that if you're in this for the long epic experience, you play it as sort of a completionist. So you're not gonna wanna play through it multiple times. Play through it once, and when you run out of time, just pretend you have another detective and start the day over and go through everything and checklist everything and make sure you've read everything. But uh, an influential game, I wish we could see more of those. And this might be the time to, to tell you that I'm working on a kind of spiritual successor to Gumshoe. Whether it will ever get finished, I'm not sure. Set in New York City and spanning many decades, but we'll see if that happens. But very influential to me, at least. And um, we've not seen anything like it since 1985, and that's a shame. So Gumshoe, number one most epic, hardcore, narrative detective mystery game. So there you have it. Let's wrap up with some final thoughts and advice. My main advice for, well, look, if you already know you love these long epic games, you don't need any advice for me. Part of the fun is figuring out how to get better at playing them and enjoying them. But if you're sort of on the fence here, let me just talk a little to you. You get out of these games what you put into them. Someone said on a post about our channel that when they found the channel, they were, they felt like they had found their tribe of people who takes these games seriously. And I think that's how you get the most enjoyment out of these. You take them as life or death mysteries that must be solved, that it's important to get right. And I do think that you can, these are games you absolutely can play solo, but to get the most out of these games, you really need someone else to bounce ideas off of and to debate with about what's going on. It's simply impossible as a solo player to have the same kind of brainstorming and back and forth about theories that you do with at least one other person. And I think if you're gonna play 60 hours on a game, you have to find the person you're compatible with. So I do encourage you to try to find someone who appreciates these games as much as you do and is willing to sort of invest their full energies into it. The longer the game, the more note-taking becomes important. We've, there are a bunch of games in this genre that I've covered on this list that do really reward good note-taking. We found that using a Google Docs shared document that you can edit as you go is a very good solution, but you may prefer to test your ability to take handwritten notes. It will be harder though. For me, the longer the better. And um, 
if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, you may want to check out our channel, come back and visit and help us decide what games to play next. If you know of a long form detective game that I haven't played yet, let me know. You might also see in addition to the playthroughs and the reviews, my video called um, Remedial Detective School for Narrative Mystery Gamers where I talk about some tips for keeping, taking notes and playing these games and what kind of things to look for, etc. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.